Thank you, Bobby. Um, I'm Vivek, it's Xscape Photonics. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about a WDM platform for AI fabrics. So one thing that I wanted to, um, wanted all of you to take away from this talk, uh, if, you, if you have to leave after this slide, is one, uh, the key information is, we think silicon photonics WDM is the platform of choice when it comes to future inter and intra rack level Xscape bandwidth scaling for all rack unit architectures um, that the customers are thinking about, whether it is pluggables, whether it is co-packaged optics, uh, whether it is interposers. Um, no matter what you're thinking about, silicon photonic WDM is the platform of choice. Right? Um, and when we are thinking about uh, Xscape bandwidth, what we are talking about, um, I just wanted to level set on what I mean by Xscape photonics and what is Xscape bandwidth. Um, discussions look like, right? So today when, you, when you're looking at um, GPU performance scaling, um, within a package, there are a bunch of high bandwidth interconnects between GPU to memory that's transmitting data at like tera, multi terabyte per second. Um, and that's something that uh, the industry has, knows how to scale, how to solve. Right, um, but when you're thinking about how much of bandwidth escapes out of the GPU into a cluster, whether it is on a board or off board, when you're connecting multiples of these racks together, um, there's a significant taper in that escape bandwidth that gets out of the silicon, right? And um, the focus of my talk and what I mean by escape bandwidth is really how much am I gonna squeeze out of the system at a system level, not at the chip level, right? Um, so this is a rendering of, uh, um, this, this slide is probably outdated uh, based on what is happening at OCP today. Uh, but this is a, a rendering of what, uh, the kind of what an architecture typically looks like in, in a data center where you're talking about roughly 200X, anywhere between 150, 200X bandwidth taper uh, when, when you're escaping out of the system, right? Um, and uh, when you, when you look at it from a rack level, I think uh, Rang Chen captured it really well in his talk. Uh, you're talking about in a single rack um, of an NVL72 system for the latest GB200, almost 5,000 copper cables, right? Each transmitting data at like 200 gigabits per port, right? Um, so that, uh, if, you, if you take a closer look at it, you, you are looking at 18 GPU trays and nine switch trays, right? And each of those uh, switches, actually, there are two, two copies of switches, two socket switches in a, in a given tray in one RU, right? So in a 27 RU rack, you are, you are fitting in almost 27, um, like 18 GPUs and switch, and you are escaping out one petabit per second of uh, switching bandwidth, right? Um, and that's a 120 kilowatt system today, right? And 5,000 cables. Now, if we were to, uh, looking at a large language model growth, which is 10X every six months, I think, or every, uh, every one year, you have to scale the rack performance almost eight to 10X, right? To keep up with the uh, demand of the customer, right? And um, so this is a what if study of, uh, just a thought study on what could that look like, right? If I have to squeeze that much amount of bandwidth out of a system at a single rack level, you're thinking about an NVL 288 kind of a cluster, right? Um, which might involve like a megawatt uh, power to a rack. And uh, this is not insane because this is something that we've actually seen in the talks that, uh, that has happened in the last couple of days. Right, uh, we've actually sh sh seen renderings of uh, like a liquid cooled rack uh, the, where you are delivering one megawatt of power. Right? And that requires like 41,472 envelope copper cables, right? Uh, transmitting data at 200 gigabit per second. Um, again, I don't, I'm, yet, I'm yet to see if you can actually physically fit that many cables, uh, looking at the size of these cables. And I'm not sure if uh, the industry is still gonna rely on some fan power and some airflow through these cables because I'm pretty sure you cannot see them anymore, right? But um, assuming that uh, this, is, this is what is needed, we, we already started to see that the, the current way of like building these systems is inefficient. It's not as elegant, right? So the solution is gonna go into like two rack units and you're gonna think about like multiple racks connecting with optics, right? Um, and um, 
So let's just like take a step back and see what, what would it look like if you were to replace all these bulky copper cables with like a single fiber, right? And um, so um, this is just our view on what that um, topology could look like, right? All to all is something that is taken for granted for these scale-up topologies, right? So today when you are thinking about NVL 72, you're looking at 400 gigabit per second per port, 72 GPUs, 18 switches, each connecting 72 radix, right? And when you're thinking about NVL 288, um, you know, it's almost 800 gigabit per second per port, right? Um, connecting 288 GPUs. Um, in this solution, when you, when you add up the bandwidth, what it translates to is like 460 terabytes per second on a single rack unit, one RU. You need to escape out 460 terabyte per second. That's 576 optical ports at 800 Gbps, right? Uh, that's basically what you would need if you were to support an NVL288 architecture in a one rack configuration, right? Um, and today when you're looking at uh, one RU unit, the maximum you get is like maybe 32 ports, not 576 ports, right? Um, so maybe you can expand it to like a 36 port. Maybe you can widen the rack. You can make it deeper. Uh, you can grow the size of the rack. So that's why I'm calling this a super rack, right? Uh, so you can try increasing the size to fit fit within a 27 hour uh, super rack. But at the end of the day, you're probably thinking about, let's say, an OSFP form factor, not actually a, a, a standards compliant. I'm just talking about fitting 36 OSFP form factor cables in 12.8 tera, you need to escape out 12.8 terabits per second in that OSFP form factor, all right? Um, and that solution doesn't exist today at all, right? No one knows how to do that. Uh, 1.6 terabit per second is, uh, the maximum you can get out of an OSFP form factor is 800 gigabit per second, right? Uh, OSFP XD is probably 1.6 T, right? So today there are no connectors out there that can uh, uh, support 64 channels at 200 gigabit per second, right? Um, but it's a solvable problem. I think Rang Cheng talked about copper connectors uh, that are getting solved. Um, but then you need to still support that many radix. You need to support like uh, 800 gigabit per second per fiber, right? And you need 16 fibers if you were to support the radix that uh, the end customer wants. Um, so you certainly need lower power optics, like linear optics, it needs to be extremely low power. And um, I'm not aware of any modulator technology that can do 800 gigabit per second. Um, I would love to talk to someone who can do that. Uh, I would be funding them as well, right? So, uh, but uh, I'm assuming beyond 100 gigabit, like 200 is what we've seen so far. There are like uh, other modulator technologies that are being worked at. So I'm dealing with what, what we currently have, which is 100 to 200 gigabit per second modulators. So that tells me that multi-lambda is, is a no-brainer and a must-have when we are thinking about uh, squeezing out 800 gigabit per second per fiber, right? Um, and this is uh, uh, essentially when you, when you take a step back and look at a 12.8 terabit module uh, that is needed for this kind of a application, that translates to roughly, what, 0.5 terabits per second per millimeter beachfront, right? And this is probably the best you can ever do because that's pretty much what escapes out of the package today, right? When you look at uh, uh, GB200 package, you're looking at uh, roughly like 0.4 to 0.5 uh, to 0.6 terabit per second coming out of the package, right? Um, so if you really want to, but if you, you see the big discrepancy between escape bandwidth and in-package bandwidth uh, density, right? You're talking about um, at least four to five X a higher bandwidth density within the package then what gets out of the package, right? Uh, 2.5, 6 terabits per second per millimeter, right? Um, and I think this is where uh, a co-packaged optics implementations can provide the next step up, where you convert all these uh, data to optical data and get the, uh, data, uh, get the bandwidth on a single fiber, right? Um, and again, the reason I think multi-wavelength laser is a must have and uh, multicolor solution is a must have for this application is predominantly because um, you can do the math yourself. Uh, you have a fiber, the best fiber pitch that is shipping in volume today in volume is oh, uh, one to seven micron pitch, right? Um, 
And let's say in the future, the industry is able to get to a 400 gigabit modulator. So the maximum you can get with standard like non-coherent modulation for these applications is probably like a, um, 400 gig in a single fiber, right? Um, if you stick with a single lambda solution, right? Uh, and that translates to 1.5 terabits per second per millimeter beach front, right? Um, so fundamentally, but if you squeeze out 64 lambdas at like 200 gigabit per second, this is just a futuristic uh, look at what, what can happen. Uh, squeezing that many bandwidth on a single fiber, you, uh, you will never be bandwidth density constrained, right? Now you are just gonna be relying on like packaging technologies and CMOS silicon, and you're just gonna continue matching whatever uh, CMOS scaling looks like, right? Um, so, and uh, the industry has not been able to implement these kind of solutions because uh, the current solutions don't scale. They are very unreliable. They don't scale beyond certain number of wavelengths. The cost parity that uh, one of the uh, audience asked about um, becomes makes a extremely challenging uh, proposition for someone to deploy this kind of a solution, right? And uh, that is something that we are looking to solve at Xcape, where we take one laser, one chip, and we generate like hundreds of wavelengths, right? Um, and that's really what we are introducing um, at OCP uh, is um, industry's first uh, programmable multicolor photonics platform uh, for different use cases within uh, AI data center fabrics, right? And um, uh, this is our first product. This is an actual device. You can come take a look at the booth. You can measure the laser spectrum if you like. Um, uh, we invite you to our lab. We are happy to give you samples. Um, uh, so this is one laser where we can generate multiple colors, um, so anywhere between four to 16. It can be programmed in terms of number of spacing and the power per la lambda that we get out of it. Um, so in summary, um, photonic WDM platform, x Chromex, Chromax, um, can address all the future inter and intra-rack level x bandwidth uh, challenges that um, different rack unit architectures experience today. Thank you. Thank you, Vivek. Uh, any questions? Oh, hi, Vivek. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, so how many wavelengths would you be using? I know at one point, uh, Karen Bergerman, she was talking about like 64 or 128 wavelengths. Are you, uh, from a solution to get the bandwidth you need, would you be using more like something like 4, 8, or 16, or are you looking at some of the higher? So what's the... So our current customers are uh, requesting uh, anywhere between 4 to 16 wavelengths from us. Okay. So that's our current focus. Okay, so thanks. Thank you. Uh, Vivek, quick question. How much uh, power you can get out of each wavelength in your comb? Is that um, programmable as well? Yeah, so... Uh, the power is not programmable. The number of wavelengths and the spacing is programmable. In terms of the power, we can go up to uh, 10 milliwatts per lambda on a 16 wavelength grid. 10 dBm, do you actually use for it? Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. That's right. Thank you for your talk. Um, you're targeting uh, 800 gig per fiber to maximize the escape bandwidth. But if you could do that with a reduced cladding fiber or a multi-core fiber, uh, wouldn't you solve the same problem that way? Uh, depends on uh, the uh, density that you get out of it, if it can meet the escape density that, that is needed in the 12.4 tera, yes. Uh, what happens is when you do multi-core fiber, what people don't realize is to fit 64 channels in that kind of a form factor, you would probably need uh, to fit that many lasers as well. If you're, st you're sticking with a single a lambda solution, the number of lasers is gonna go up. So there is a need for higher uh, integration and there is a need for higher bandwidth density on that front, right? And the second point is uh, multi-core. Um, at the end of the day, uh, in economies of scale matters a lot. Uh, so automating these things and uh, getting to the price point that the end customer wants is extremely important. Uh, so any solutions that can actually be fully automated and uh, when you can uh, rely on like wafer scale or large volume processing technologies to drive down the cost, is 
way more attractive in general. So I'm not sure how the fiber costs have reduced over the years, and I'm not sure how, uh, uh, what is the scaling of fiber cost looks like over number of channels. Uh, but um, where I come from, uh, I've always been told that it's manually pick and place on an array most of the time. So it's not actually like automated fiber array placement and things like that. Right? Thank you. Um, uh, manufacturing is a challenge uh, uh, in high volume with something that's new like that. So understand. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Vivek. Uh, are you assuming the uh, external laser source kind of architectures, or do you have uh, separate uh, modulators at the, at the far end or any places? or your product does have included that modulations, et cetera? Uh, so our customers implement all different kinds of architectures, uh, so we don't influence that. Uh, we support all different SKUs. Just only the COM generations? Uh, we Maybe. generate multi-wavelengths and we give them multi-wavelengths. Okay. Got it, okay. So um, I, have a, I have a question. So your 100 um, your wavelength source had uh, a worst case spread of 20 dB between comb lines. Uh, that's a pretty bad multi-wavelength source, I would say. And your, your product that you showed had like 5 dB spread. Can you comment on getting a, a reasonable spread between your supply uh, uh, li uh, uh, lines of, of the comb? Uh, so, so those are all like real measurement spectrum. So these are like initial set of uh, test samples that came back, right? Uh, and some of those actually have real tabs on them uh, that are real, since they are real measurements. And uh, uh, some of those are like measurement artifacts because we are tapping out some uh, data to be able to measure that many lines, right? So we can get into some of those details when we uh, so are happy to like host you then. What, what, what you do? would you expect to be a reasonable spread between comb lines? Any, like anywhere between 0.5 to 1 dB. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thank you very much, we'll be back.